a, a partner that was built 40, um, 40 to 45 years ago. And they never had like some a good rehabilitation program for that, like good maintenance work. So we are trying to rehabilitate that 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 power station. We are working on we have a project we are developing uh, we are trying to develop now for the power transmission. Once you rehabilitate the, the power generation station, then the, the transmission line that goes from the station to like to port point that was built also 45 years ago, you need to ensure that the power that you produce, you can move it to the people that you, you are going to serve. Okay. That's another project, project that we are, we are trying to develop, develop now. We are uh, trying to build a substation in Taba. Again, that's the same issue where 40, 45 years ago, where they had distribution circuits in Haiti, but you didn't have that many people in port of France, as we are talking now. So we get to a point where like, all the circuits that you had, they are congested. So we are trying to, to, to install a new substation to, to, to move the power in a much better way, to, to decrease losses on the system. We also have a programs where we are dealing with renewable energy like solar, energy and stuff that we are working more in the rural area, helping the clinics, hospitals, and other things. Now, as far as this program, why do we want to help? The bank, all total, the bank has 48 members, member countries, and Haiti is one of them. And I don't have to talk a lot about that, but you know about all the issues that we have in Haiti about people cutting trees, okay, so that they can cook, they can do other things. So, in our opinion, a program like that will help, okay, in, I will say, four main things. The first thing, if we are working on hydro generation, okay, power hydro generation, one of the issues that you may have with that is when people are cutting trees, okay? What problems you will have is that you won't have water, like in the rivers, right? You will have inund inundation problems, okay? And like flooding issues. And also, at some point, you, you will get to a point where the power generation, they won't have enough water in the river to make, to, 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 to make the turbine, but I don't want to be too technical, turn and then to, to put the spout. Second thing, it is a burden for us as an interdevelopment, as a development bank, to help our member countries, okay, for a sustainable social and economical development. After that, the most important thing for us is that we need to optimize the use of human and natural resources for our member countries. They already, I, I was already told that I only have one minute left. So I want to get one last point, one important thing for us for Haiti is to provide a long-term, in, in our opinion, this program will, will provide a long-term long -term environmental benefit. I talk about the water, but you think also about the people, the way that people are living in Haiti. So anything that you can do that will improve the way, the way that people are living in Haiti, the bank is there, the bank is behind it, and that's why we want to support this program. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, now I, I turn to Ranyi Chang uh, on behalf of the Global Alliance for Clean Cookstoves, of, of which Public Private Alliance Foundation and uh, uh, Project Gaia and Clean Star Ventures uh, are all uh, members of that organization. Uh, in, in fact, we, uh, we were working in the field of uh, uh, improved cooking before the Global Alliance was created, so we're very happy to have this uh, building up as an international priority. Randy. Thank you, David, um, and thanks for the invitation to be here, and good morning to everyone. Um, I think the, the speakers this morning already have discussed a lot of the, the reasons why we're all here in terms of the environmental, health, um, and livelihood, gender, uh, 
impacts and potential benefits uh, for clean cooking and fuel solutions. Um, what I'm going to focus on is the goal that uh, the Global Alliance has put together for ourselves and also with, with its uh, over 600 partners as well to achieve the adoption of 100 million, to have 100 million households adopting clean cooking solutions, including stoves and fuels by 2020. And so, um, you know, that's a, that's a rather ambitious goal, but, you know, with the Secretariat and the, the hundreds of partners that we're working with, including many people in this room, I think uh, there's a potential, but of course, we all know it's a complex problem as well. Um, you know, to reach that goal, it's not just going to be one household over the next 10 or so years buying one stove. You know, it, it, it needs to be sustainable that when that stove reaches the end of its lifetime, that second stove needs to be purchased as well, and, and so on and so on. Um, but of course, there needs to be a market and distribution available for that. So it's almost like we need to have uh, build up the chicken and egg all at the same time, rather than one coming before the other. So that's that, that challenge of needing to build up the demand and the supply together along with all these other aspects um, really drives the approach that the Global Alliance for Clean Cookstoves is taking in how it's supporting its 600 partners. And so our goal is really to provide the partners and the market and the sector with the resources and the tools, the information um, to be able to uh, catalyze the sector. So uh, in terms of the areas of focus, it really covers, I think, how we see uh, this being a complex challenge that needs to be addressed from a number of different ways. So starting from research to figure out uh, you know, what exactly are the benefits and what are the best ways to achieve those benefits for environment, health, gender, livelihoods, um, including the behavioral aspects as well as the technology, everything in between. Uh, we're also focused on standards and testing to ensure that the stoves and fuels are of increasingly higher and higher quality and performance. Um, and as I mentioned, we're also working on convening the sector, bringing partners together, also uh, co collecting the knowledge and resources and tools to make that available. Um, and on the market side as well, uh, we're focused on connecting investors and entrepreneurs, uh, piloting innovative approaches that can then be scaled, uh, so starting in specific small areas and then taking those successes and then growing them and really focused along that, all the challenges across technology, distribution, manufacturing, I should switch that, manufacturing, distribution, and also adoption as well. And I'll leave it at that. I'm really looking forward to the discussion throughout the morning. Thank you. Thank you very much, Randy. Uh, now, uh, I think that we will uh, uh, invite the, this group of speakers to step down, and the, uh, the next, uh, group, uh, which includes Fritz, uh, as well as uh, Judy Hoffman and George Garland to come up. Uh, and I will take the opportunity to, uh, to talk a little bit about the, the work of the Public Private Alliance Foundation with its partners in Haiti. But uh, first, let me uh, thank the, uh, the current group of speakers. George and Judy are coming up, let me remind you that the, the, the words that we're hearing from our various speakers now feed into the discussion groups that we'll have, and these speakers will be participating in those discussion groups as well uh, on, uh, on, on the various uh, uh, six topics. I may as well mention them now. Uh, um, stoves, fuel, distribution, distillation, financing and awareness and the, uh, the as you know the purposes of this uh, meeting today are to to uh, to look at the, the current situation and to discuss ways of advancing the pilot work that is underway in, in Haiti and elsewhere and as a second major point to encourage greater awareness 
uh, to various uh, groups, whether it be consumers uh, all the way up to public at large, of the, the benefits of uh, ethanol cookstoves as an option in overcoming uh, charcoal and the, uh, the other uh, wood and uh, 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 biomass that is uh, you know, such a problem in the world for cooking. All right, the, um, you see before you, I'll stand up for a moment. Uh, you see before you uh, two examples of uh, the uh, uh, stoves that have been made for quite some time by the Dometic Company. And uh, over here on this side, uh, a traditional um, uh, charcoal stove that uh, is used by so many people in Haiti. And uh, the, uh, the photographs on this uh, signboard here show the, the work that has uh, been underway since last September. And let me hold it up and, and discuss it very briefly. With, uh, oh, that's not going to work. Uh, you hold it. <laughs> you, you try not to get, uh, you try not to get uh, hidden. All right, so the, the, uh, the Dometic uh, company has been making uh, ethanol stoves and uh, quite a variety of other products for uh, a long time. And these uh, clean cook stoves are the simplest item that they make. Harry Stokes will speak a little while later about the Dometic company and about the clean cook stoves. Uh, the Project Gaia, uh, which is headed by Harry Stokes, has been kind enough to uh, donate uh, a number of these uh, Dometic stoves to a pilot project that uh, Public Private Alliance Foundation and SIM Act and Path to Haiti and uh, the uh, uh, Art Creation Foundation for Children and the, uh, another group that had not previously been mentioned this morning, the Association of Farmers and Distillers of Leogan, which deals with uh, sugarcane and its uh, alcohol production, have all come together after a good bit of research and uh, networking to to achieve a pilot implementation of something that we think is, is very worthwhile. And the, the four pictures that you see up here, and you, if you can't see them now, be sure to come by at the, at the break and uh, take a closer look. They represent uh, four key elements. The, the picture down here of a woman and her baby, uh, they're standing next to uh, a, a charcoal uh, brazier that is the, uh, the, the way most people in Haiti cook, uh, either on a, a double, as this one is, or on a single, as you see there, and they, they burn through in short order. They need to be replaced. They have uh, uh, toxic fumes. They are a, a problem for respiratory uh, diseases. They were a problem for poverty, and then charcoal in general and wood is a problem for deforestation in Haiti. And this woman, as you see her here, with this kind of setup, is caught in a trap. She's caught in a trap of poverty, disease, deforestation. And the work that we are trying to undertake is to help people get out of that trap. Now, as it happens, this same woman is the woman that you see in the red blouse up here in this corner picture where in September the first stoves made by Dometic, donated by Project Gaia, were uh, put into service at the Art Creation Foundation for Children in Jacques Mel. And the, the reason why that organization was chosen is because to have a, a this is an artisan's training school and other kinds of things too, but primarily artisan's training school. And I have one minute, yes. Uh, I'll go quick. The, uh, to, uh, the, uh, you have to be a very low income uh, child and family to be associated with that school. Judy Hoffman will talk more about that in a few minutes. And so that is an excellent uh, pilot group for uh, low income, and it is a, a well-run organization with uh, a, a good establishment that's, that is easy to work with. 
So uh, we set up this in September, and you see in this picture a dozen uh, of these ethanol stoves all lit up in one room with no smoke, no fumes, everybody happy, and uh, providing a nice hot flame. You see over in the top right corner uh, a, a pair of these uh, ethanol stoves set up, again, in the, same, in the home of this same woman. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and cooking for her quickly. Uh, uh, we, we asked uh, how long it took to make coffee previously, and uh, she said, oh, a long time. How long did it take this morning? It was immediate. That's the kind of thing that we're looking for. This is, uh, this is a, a solution with problems, as we'll discuss, but as a solution. And down in the bottom uh, right corner, is uh, are, are three of the uh, young people who are uh, at the Art Creation Foundation and working with us as junior junior staff, you might say, junior monitors. And the uh, they're teenagers. The girl in this picture, in the middle, is the daughter of the woman who, who we've been talking about in these other three pictures. She's going to have a different life. And the, the objects that you see those three holding are paper mache masks uh, for the carnival in Jacmel, and the, the kids at the Art Creation Foundation are learning to be artisans, and those are the kind of things that they can produce. So that's a wrap. Thank you. <laughs> Next, I would like to invite um, Judy Hoffman. No, wait a minute, excuse me. Uh, 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 Fritz Harville to talk about uh, promoting business and investment in Haiti, including diaspora support. And we have quite a number of diaspora people in this room today. Oh, can, I, can everyone hear me? <coughs> yeah. Again, good morning to everyone. Uh, nearly uh, four years ago, this project, this program, was introduced to the Haitian community um, by Project Gaia and PPAF to the help of CMAC Foundation and later to, uh, uh, with the Path to Haiti. Now, I'm sitting here wearing two hats. One is for Path and the other one is CMAC. As many of you may have heard of the name CMAC, CMAC is an acronym for Société Immobilière des Mines, the Agriculture, uh, Commerce, and Tourism. It's a group of uh, Haitian American professionals putting together a holding company and investing in Haiti. Uh, through that experience, I have acquired a lot, a great deal of information that I think uh, I can put to good use uh, for those who inspire or who wish to do business in Haiti. Then PATH was created as a business consulting firm, providing an array of services for that purpose. Uh, since uh, Dr. Stinman and I, we've been working for almost uh, four years in this project. So we, we, we took so many trips to Haiti back and forth uh, with uh, the backing of Project Gaia. Um, as you already know, that Project Gaia supplied the stores, and uh, PPAF and, and their efforts provide the ethanol for the, to conduct the uh, pilot project that we launched in Haiti in September. Now, uh, as a Haitian born, I have uh, seen the devastation of uh, deforestation caused by, this is a hurricane prone country. Every year we have been uh, visited by a uh, hurricane and some cause uh, greater damage than others. But nevertheless, uh, Haiti has always been the subject of uh, uh, problems with, uh, with, uh, with this type of situation. So when this project came to CMAC Foundation, as I said, I wear two hats. The other hat is for CMAC. And uh, we embraced the project immediately. 
because we see this is a project not only that has an impact, a social economic impact uh, for the country, but as well as uh, provide a solution for a problem that has been in existence for years. So I'm here to report to you, because I know all of you have an interest in what we're doing in Haiti, and that's why you're here. And I'm, uh, I'm here to report to you that this project has been well received by the Haitian people. And, uh, and I would say from all sectors, from all work of life in the social sphere of Haiti, from government officials all the way to the bottom to the end users of this. And uh, as you know, in Haiti, <coughs> women do most of the cooking. As a result, you, you can also imagine when uh, a pregnant woman is doing the cooking and held those uh, fumes uh, that is, uh, can be damaging to the, to the unborn. So uh, on behalf of those who have uh, really uh, uh, encouraged to see this uh, project uh, to full implementation in Haiti, I would say continue to, to uh, uh, support this project, anything that each one of you can do to make this project a reality and Haiti, it's welcome. Uh, I know I don't have much time, but uh, if anyone wish to, uh, we will have a session uh, to discuss a plenary session. So at this time, anybody who wants to have, who have a question, who wants to uh, find out how to form a business in Haiti, given the fact that we've been there, we know you can either speak to Dr. Stillman or speak to me. Thank you. Thank you, Fritz. The, uh, the, uh, the program that we've been uh, undertaking uh, has been at, at several levels, uh, with uh, low-income mothers, with community groups in Leogan, uh, with uh, uh, small business in Jacmel and with a hotel in Jacmel uh, where we've been able to use these stoves at different uh, test groups uh, with, uh, with the results that, that come back from that we will strengthen the program. I would like to invite uh, Judy Hoffman to speak about the Art Creation Foundation for Children and the association of that organization with this effort. I am delighted to be here. I appreciate you inviting me to speak. Um, I just would like to give you a little bit of background about our Creation Foundation for Children. We were founded in 2003 on, on the assumption that if a child could make a paper mache bowl or bird and then somehow find a way to market it, that child will never starve, uh, become a resident, or have to be a prostitute. Very simple. We had no money and six street kids and um, some wonderful colleagues in Haiti to begin this program. Um, this is a program now um, with over 100 children, their siblings, families are also involved, and it has developed into a very communal type of program with, um, with arts as the core, um, now doing mosaic work in Jacques Mill, also um, learning new construction techniques, and um, always with a, a goal of our youth becoming teens, our teens becoming transitional, and um, being able to support themselves and their families moving forward. Um, so this project was a perfect match because it, um, as well as giving our, um, some of our moms an opportunity to cook with ethanol, it also gave um, a youth team an opportunity to learn how to monitor, collect information, and manage a research program. Um, I want to speak a little bit to um, how women cook in Haiti, and I'm speaking of what I consider to be, I won't say top and bottom, I'm going to say regular people. Um, most of these women are cooking once a day. They are cooking with charcoal on um, braziers like you see below, or even something a lot rougher that's made of pieces of rebar and some wire across it. They burn out constantly. Um, these are women who do not have much money. Perhaps they're selling something in the market, and if they have enough money at the end of the day, they will buy some charcoal for the next day. 
if their stove burns out, they may borrow someone else's. Or go to a neighbor, ask for credit, um, get a new stove, and three weeks later, when they make something at the market, they then are able to pay for the stove. Um, if they're out of charcoal, same thing. They'll borrow it from a friend or not cook one day. Um, they tend to cook large amounts of food, beans, rice, sauce, and hopefully some, um, some meat, some fish. Uh, but that meal that's being cooked might be cooked in the morning, reheated for lunch, and eaten again for dinner, and maybe even to the next morning. So there's not three meal a day cooking, and the volume um, being cooked may even be shared with friends and neighbors. So the idea of the ethanol stove for these women was absolutely wonderful. It meant they didn't have to bend down. It meant that they could cook indoors on a rainy day. In fact, one of the women had, had made a comment about that rain was pouring down and I could still cook a meal. However, um, when we moved into phase two, in phase one they were given fuel to use, in phase two they were asked to purchase the fuel, um, we ran into some difficulty because there was no system in place to allow for um, a marchand to lend some ethanol to someone so that they could cook a meal and then um, three days later pay that ethanol back or um, pay for it with, with money. Um, and they, they love cooking with ethanol, but uh, as I see it, if there is not a way for within cultural context for the ethanol and also for the stoves to become available, um, it will not be workable for um, the, the regular families that we see in Haiti. Um, when we talk about cell phones and cell phone penetration, it's very true. Everyone has one, but often they run out of minutes. And um, you can borrow or, um, or lend minutes from one person to another. So it's that same concept as in the market, where years ago, one of the kids said to me, can I borrow some minutes? And I had no idea what they were talking about. And then chit 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 like that, they did something on my phone, and then they had minutes on their phone. Um, I was astounded. But take that same concept and think about an ethanol stove project and um, making the fuel available at a very local level with people who are trained beyond, um, I sell in the market and I know I'm okay if I end up with money at the end of the day as opposed to I'm not okay if I didn't. So business skills um, and a way to make this fuel available within cultural context is what I see as being absolutely critical. Thank you very much, Judy. Uh, now, George, I'm going to have to ask to do two things. One is to talk a bit about uh, how he sees the environmental and, 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 and health and gender situation of cooking in Haiti. Uh, George comes from an environmental EPA background. But also, uh, our friend uh, Marty Baruso, who was supposed to be here today to speak about uh, sugarcane and distilleries, is unable to make it, and so George has agreed to fill in on, on that as best he can. And uh, so I'll, I'll give you uh, the floor and wish you good luck. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's been my pleasure to take advantage of the many years that Fritz and, and uh, David and Harry Stokes have put into this um, to be involved in the pilot phase and to come to know several things. Uh, yes, indeed, Haiti has about 2% of its forest cover left, and it's still going great guns toward the cliff, uh, cutting down that forest for 85%, 75-85% of its energy needs, of which the vast majority are for cooking. Imagine that. So it's a, it's a situation where the soil is eroding because the trees aren't there, and the nice man from the, the bank said, yes, they're silting up our hydroelectric uh, dams and, and we can't make, make electricity as well as we like and so forth and so on. Lots and lots of environmentally tied together situations. And uh, globally, there uh, are maybe three million deaths a year from the smoke from these stoves. Uh, luckily, the people in Haiti uh, cook outdoors, so maybe there's not quite so much uh, exposure, uh, but it's still exposure to smoke, so they're better off with ethanol. And I'm going to get to Harry 
for so many things. Of course, he provided the stove. But he also provided us with test data that showed the relative amounts of exposure from different kinds of fuel, and ethanol is about the best. And we can get into arguments about that, but I'm telling you, ethanol is where it's at. And it was a proof to me to see those uh, dozen stoves in that one room, all going at once, no problem whatsoever. Uh, and I'm seeing people as a, as a really good monitor for environmental damage, by and large. Of course, it, in the best case, people aren't the ones that have to be the, get sick in order to prove it, but in the case of cook stoves, that's what's happened. Um, now, I'd like to get into some of the detail on the economics uh, for Asian women. If you're an American woman and you cook, you spend pennies a day for either your electricity or your gas to do your cooking. If you're a Haitian woman, you spend maybe a buck a day if you can afford as much charcoal as you need for that day's cooking. A buck a day. That's a lot more than a US person pays. Now, it may be on the order of magnitude of what it would cost to cook with ethanol, but the cost of ethanol in Haiti is $9 a gallon. And in the US, it's about one-fourth of that. So if you were a US woman wanting to use ethanol, you'd already be four times ahead of a Haitian woman. And if you're a Haitian woman, you may not be quite so focused on the trees and the soil and the agriculture as you are on feeding your family. Haitian women are going to feed their families, no kidding. And they may spend half of their income to do that between buying stoves, fuel, and food. Now, Stoves, we were told, you know, your stoves may cost on the order of $60. That's an awful lot of money. But then we came to know that if you buy an aluminum stove in Haiti, it lasts about three weeks. And if you do that on an annual basis, that's $54 a year. Now, 60 sounds like more than that, except that those stoves last for five to 10 years. So yes, there's a financing issue, but no, they're not expensive. And when we went to the Rotary Club in Jacques Mel, Howie Rotary, we found out that those guys can afford to pay 30 bucks for a stove that lasts for a whole year. Now let's see, $30 for one year, $50 to $60 for five years. Hmm, what's the interest rate? That's well, kind of big. So okay, what about the ethanol? And here's where Marty Barroso would have been a real champ. Marty is, is, a, is a slow guy who knows how to make things. So he goes to the internet, and he looks up the components of what it would take to have a distillery. And he finds out that maybe for $20,000, $30,000, you can have a distillery that'll do 2,000 liters per eight hour shift, 6,000 liters for a 24 hour shift. And we can, we can get into the economics on that, but you know, uh, we can maybe cut that price in half or even less as the industry develops and more efficient distilling processes are in place. Just for the record, right now, if you want to buy ethanol in Haiti, the market for the 95% alcohol that we need is largely supplied uh, in the context of the pharmaceutical industry, and it's $500 a drum, which works out to nine bucks a gallon. Check me if you will. Um, and so it's not geared for mass production of ethanol to supply 11 million people and their households with ethanol. It's geared for a very small market. And so there's a, a lot, a lot of room for improvement of the economics of the distilling industry. Uh, right now, you can't buy an ethanol stove in Haiti if you wanted to. And we have lots of people that want to. The word of mouth advertising uh, has been great. And we have 100 people who buy a stove tomorrow if they could. They can't. The only stoves in Haiti are there thanks to Project Gaia and the International Rescue Committee on a humanitarian basis. So they can be used for pilot projects, but they can't be sold. We need stoves we can buy, uh, and we can sell them right away. That'd be great. Um, and maybe the price of those can come down as they're manufactured locally, and the stoves that we have are tailored for boats. On boats, you need space is a big issue. You want small stoves. Our folks have been telling us we want a little bit bigger stoves to handle a little bit bigger pots, and uh, that, that, that's in the, in the works. To be, and in fact, it may be available uh, for other parts of the world, but not at the moment in the supply that we have in Haiti. So yes, we can have Haitian women able to walk out to the neighborhood store and buy an ethanol stove and buy ethanol at a price that's a little less than nine bucks a gallon. And I just want to tell a, a story in, 
talk to one of the uh, women at the Kaplan Lindu Hotel who has a, an extended family of 10 for which she cooks. And yes, she has a full-time job at the hotel. And this goes to the issue of what kind of partners do we have out there for, for working uh, with and in Haiti. She gets up at 4 o'clock in the morning. She lights the charcoal. It takes 30 minutes for that charcoal to be ready to cook. She then cooks and is ready to feed her family by 5. She says, if I light the ethanol stove, I don't have to wait 30 minutes. It's ready to go. And it takes me a third less time to cook with that ethanol stove. That's what she says. And when she finishes with the charcoal, she has to take a shower because the charcoal is really dirty and it gets her hair dirty. And in order for her to do her job at the hotel, she cannot be unpresentable. So she has to take a shower at the end of the process. With ethanol, she can take a shower anytime she wants. She doesn't have to wait till the end of the process. And she might even be able to skip a day every so often, like I do. Oh, God. <laughs> So, there you have it. That's the situation. <laughs> Thank you very much. TMI. Very, much. Uh, very telling and, and, and entertaining at the same time. Uh, now, uh, we have a, a new group of three people to come up. Uh, that will be Harry Stokes, Jean-Francois Hibert, and Sagun Saxena. So, we we'll first... Thank you. 